Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's house. Today is Ash Wednesday. This is the day where for the Christian church around the world, the season of Lent begins. And and we take our time today to to pause, to reflect on our sins, to repent from our sins, uh, and to turn to Jesus, uh, who alone can forgive us. We'll be following the order of worship as you find it in your worship folder. Um, this evening it'll be a bilingual service, but today it's all in English. So you can just look at the left-hand side as you open it up. When, when we sing hymns, we'll be singing those hymns out of the hymnal. I think you still, most of you know how to use those still. Uh, there's a red hymnal in the rack in front of you when we get to that part. Um, we'll use our hymnals. We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God created us to know joy in communion with Him, to love all humanity, and to live in harmony with all creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation, and so we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended for us. By our sin, we grieve our Father, who does not desire us to come under His judgment, but to turn to Him and live, Therefore, God in His mercy has sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take our place under the law, to suffer for us, and to die the death we deserve. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. During the 40 days of Lent, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The time of Lent reminds us that to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, after we sing our hymn to confess our sins. Let's sing hymn 98, hymn 98 verses 1 and 4. Please stand for the confession of sins. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away from my groaning all day long. Then I acknowledged my sin to you 
and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Almighty God, our Creator and Redeemer, we confess that we have always been guilty of sin from childhood. Our desires are selfish. We have broken each of your commandments, choosing to follow our own will instead. We confess these are sins against you, holy God. We cannot avoid our guilt. We deserve only your anger and eternity in hell. Yet, we ask you to treat us as we do not deserve, Lord. We ask you to take pity on us and forgive us for the sake of your Son, Jesus. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. Therefore, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. During these days of Lent, let us implore God to give us renewal and his Holy Spirit. May we continue to abide in the true faith, and at the last, be received by him through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading comes from Isaiah chapter 59. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion, and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived, so justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth is stumbled in the streets, honesty cannot enter, truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one, he was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate, and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance, and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies, and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west... People will fear the name of the Lord, and from the rising of the sun they will revere his glory, for he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The gospel for today and also the, the basis for our brief meditation on God's word comes from Luke chapter 18. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves 
will be exalted. The gospel of our Lord. Are you sure? Are you sure that in the end, when, when the last day comes and you die, are you sure you're going to heaven? I can see little Lutheran heads and hearts bobbing, yes, right? Hopefully you're sure of that. God wants you to have confidence that when you, go to, when, when you die, you will go to heaven. He's promised that in his word, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And you believe by the grace of God and, and through the hearing of his word, the, the means of grace has come to you and the Holy Spirit has worked that faith in you and, and you believe, you can be sure. You can be confident that at the end, when you die, you will end up in heaven. You can say you are confident then, in a certain way, of your righteousness before God. Another way of saying that might be, I'm glad I'm not like this Pharisee. He was confident. He was confident. He never missed church. He, he gave his offerings faithfully. Everyone that looked at him knew he was confident and knew that he was an elite in the religious world. And those are all good things, right? I'm sure, I'm sure you would agree. It, it's good to give your offerings to church, to be a faithful attender. To, to, it's good to let your light shine before others and look good to other people as as a believer. I bet this Pharisee was even a lifelong believer. He could probably trace his heritage back several generations, maybe even, maybe even to the very clans that had built the temple there in Jerusalem. Let me be clear. This Pharisee and many like him this Pharisee sounds like a lot of faithful Christians I know. Oh, for crying out loud, he sounds like a lot of people I know. They look really good. They do the right things. I mean, if, 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 if you are a Christian to some degree or another, if you've been a lifelong Christian or even a Christian for only a short time, you, you want to do what is right, but there's something that sneaks in. This, this temptation of the devil, it's a subtle thing. This judgmental attitude that Jesus seems to hate while he's on this earth. A, a pharisaical attitude. When you look down your nose, either literally or figuratively, at other people. How many times? How many times in your life as a Christian have you, have you come into church, even come to, to God's house where other faithful Christians are and thought to yourselves, I hope I don't have to sit next to her. She's just not like me. Or, or maybe how many times driving down the road or at work or at school have you thought to yourself, man, that guy is really a... And you fill in the blank. And you might never say it this way. And you might not even put words to your feelings just like this. But you really do feel glad that you're not as bad as that person. I'm glad I'm not like her. I'm glad I'm not like him. Because then people wouldn't like to be around me. I'm glad that I'm as good as... I am. And then you feel a little bit better about yourself. You've increased your confidence in your own goodness and who you are. And at least you don't feel as bad, bare minimum. You don't feel as bad about your own defects and shortcomings because after all, you're better than at least someone else. That's a sneaky thing. This very real part that lives inside all of us, that just loves us. You have that inside of you, this part of you that loves 
You, and, and I know it's there. I know it's there because it's a re very real part that exists inside of me too. And I hate it, but it's still there. I mean, when you first heard this parable today, and you've heard it so many times, it, it, it probably washed over you like it was nothing. But when you hear this parable about the Pharisee and the tax collector, and you listen to it, from whose perspective do you listen to it? Do you ever finish that parable and say, yeah, I really am that Pharisee? Or do you go, I'm kind of like that tax collector, aren't I? God have mercy on me, a sinner over in the corner. That's who I want to be. He's the, he's the hero of the story in a lot of ways. Who wants to leave church not being justified? I don't, I don't want to make myself the Pharisee. Did you ever put his, yourself in his robes, though? Or was it more like, that Pharisee's a real jerk, isn't he? I'm so glad I'm not like him. I'm more like that humble tax collector. Do you see what you did there? <laughs> you became confident in yourself. You thought you were better than the Pharisee, didn't you, you Pharisees? I do it too. And I look at God's Ten Commandments, and we start with the first one, the simplest of them all. You should have no other gods before me. And I shudder. I shudder to think how often I have, just like you have, like the Pharisee in the parable Jesus told, how often I have made myself an idol before God. I'm just like that Pharisee. In so many ways, I love to downplay my sins and minimize my own evils and exaggerate the sins of my neighbor because it makes me feel better. And it makes you feel better, maybe, for a little while, but it doesn't remove the sin. It doesn't remove the guilt of your own idolatry and the very real sins, many of them that live in your hearts. And you should know the punishment for idolatry too. The Bible is very clear. It's death and it's hell. Ugh. I'm just like the Pharisee in so many ways. And that affects everything I do and the way I live and the way I see the world around me. But in the end, it's not so important which one of these I'm like, if I'm like the Pharisee, it's much more important where I put my confidence. In whom I put my confidence. Because we are like this Pharisee, we are like this self-righteous person, like the people who were confident in their own righteousness that Jesus first told this parable to. We're like them, but do you want to know the irony? <laughs> we're like the tax collector too. Sometimes we look really good. And sometimes we look really bad. But Jesus came to save us all. We are like, we are alike, the tax collectors and the Pharisees. We are alike like this. We are all sinners. And that's the silly thing. We're all broken, but we like to think we're not. So Jesus comes along and he shows us through a story just how broken we are. And he shows us that we are either robbers or, or evildoers or adulterers or however you fall short of the perfection that God demands. But the one you put your confidence in, <laughs> you know what you're like. But, but the one you put your confidence in, what's he like? Jesus lived and he taught and he suffered, and he died just like one of us. Except he did it all perfectly. And even though he is the Son of God in human flesh, who has every right to be proud and confident in himself, he does it all perfectly humbly as an act of service to you. And to me, what is the one you have your confidence in? What is that one like? He loves you. He loves 
me. He loves us, the robber, the evildoer, the adulterer, the tax collector, the Pharisee. He came to save us all. Can you even imagine? Can you even imagine what that must have been like? If he had only come to save people who were good enough, he wouldn't have come to save anybody at all. Instead, he came to, to save the sins, save the whole world, to wash away the sins of the whole world without any bias, without any prejudice for the way people look, without showing any favoritism for family lines or, or nationality. He never acted like he was too good for the work or like he was in some way better than us. He didn't put his confidence in himself. He easily could have done that, but he always trusted in his father, and he always obeyed his father's will. And this guy, the perfect one, he was humble. Not like the Pharisee. And the, the very last line of the parable, it's in your worship folder, but I'll read it for you. Jesus says, I tell you this man, that this man, the, the, the tax collector, rather than the other, rather than the Pharisee, went home justified before God. Why? For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. One exalted himself, put his confidence in himself. The other humbled himself, put his confidence in his God. So when you are tempted to put your confidence in yourselves, when I'm tempted to do the same, I pray that God humbles us. I pray that He does it. And it's typically not very fun to be humbled. And I don't know how He'll humble you or how He'll humble me, but I'll pray that in one way or another, or another He'll do it. So humble yourselves. Humble yourselves like the tax collector in the corner. Today, Ash Wednesday, is the day we set aside to take a piece of the humble pie and repent. Recognize our sins. Turn from them. Turn to God. And we recognize also that whether Pharisee or tax collector, whether Lutheran for life or Lutheran for the last few months, either way, we are dust. And God loves dust by the grace of God. He loves dust because Jesus became dust for us. He humbled himself and he went to war for dust. And because of Jesus, God loves us. God loves you, you Pharisees. God loves you, you tax collectors. God loves you. You Christians, I am a little like that Pharisee every now and then, and so are you. But even when you recognize that, you can beat your breast like the tax collector and pray for God to have mercy on you. Have mercy on us, Lord, miserable sinners. And you can be sure that he does. You can be confident, <laughs> not in your own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Christ. That Christ Jesus who humbly and faithfully serves you and serves me. Amen. We continue our worship singing hymn 122. 122 stands as 1, 3, and 5.
At this time, we will have the imposition of ashes. I want you to know, not everyone is used to this tradition. Uh, it's an optional thing that no one will usher you forward. You can come forward as you feel comfortable to do it. This uh, imposition of ashes is an ancient custom in the Christian church uh, and has been for, for centuries, something we do to remind us of, of that, the fact that we truly are dust uh, and ashes before God. So please come forward as you feel comfortable. Ash Wednesday is a day of repentance today. We are reminded of our human frailty and our need for Christ. The ashes forcefully remind us of our need for grace. I assure you, you can be confident in your salvation, not because you got ashes on your forehead, uh, not because you have performed enough good deeds, not because of your membership in a visible church. You can be confident in your salvation because the one that believes and is baptized will be saved. You believe in Jesus, salvation is yours. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to remember those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. Missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. Grant them patience and endurance. Help us to remember those also who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the, the chronically ill, those who are depressed or lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. And help us, all of us here, Run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing our closing hymn, hymn 388. Thanks again for, for coming to worship. If, if you brought an offering envelope or something like that, the basket is by the door on your way out. Feel free to, to leave an offering there. Also, after uh, church ends right here and you walk out, if you wanted to stick around for a light lunch, it's not super huge or anything like that, but a nice light lunch has been provided for us. It's just to take a left and then another left down the long hallway in the all-purpose room. And since there's a meal, let's join in the common table prayer, asking God to bless the food. Let's pray. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen. God's blessings on your week. Mm -hmm.